front of this live audience. Um, Pam, you've had uh, some trips around the sun that I would say have probably been better than what most folks have. So um, while we're getting everybody on live here, do you want to give us a little bit of a, a taste of your background and uh, sort of how this hall, uh, everything evolved here for you? And then we'll, we'll get into the, uh, the, uh, the meat and potatoes of it, why everyone's here, and we'll get into the presentation. So without further ado. Thank you so much, Josh. And I, I have to thank uh, Dave Walters Yachts uh, for having these uh, webinars and cocktail parties and everything that brings us all closer together when we're all really kind of bound to our screens over the next uh, couple of weeks or months or something like that. So thank you very much because this is exciting to get us all together this way when we can't be sharing an anchorage or, or being in each other's living rooms and discussing what we are all passionate about, which of course is, is sailing. Um, yeah, so I, I grew up in Chicago. I was a little girl up in Chicago, and uh, my dad was a, a very a fanatic racing sailor, and I would race with him all summer long, which was just three months long, and I never learned a thing, but I was uh, the one who made the bologna sandwiches and passed up the cold beer, and uh, <laughs> I, I enjoyed the sailing, but I, I didn't learn too much. I fell in love with several crew members, one of which was Gary Comer. You remember Gary Comer? He started Land's End. Yeah. Um, he was one of my dad's crew. Anyway, um, I ended up going to University of Wisconsin where I started sailing on Lake Mendota with the Huffers Sailing Club there at the University of Wisconsin. I became the Commodore there for a couple of years. Um, so that's where I really learned how to sail small boats, tech dinghies, sea scows, things like that. And after I spent uh, four years at uh, University of Wisconsin, I knew I never wanted to see snow again. So I got in my car. I drove down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I was very fortunate. I got a job right away uh, working for yacht brokers uh, and uh, became quite involved in the, in the yachting scene that was very small back in those days. Um, but it was a very tight group of, of wonderful people. Um, one day when I was typing up a listing, for those of you who remember what a typewriter is, <laughs> I, was, I would mostly be dreaming looking outside the windows and I saw this really good looking guy walk by, he was really tall, blonde hair, and I ran into the bathroom and pinched my cheeks and went out and introduced myself to him. Turns out he was a young Australian um, who had just sailed around Cape Horn in his little 30 foot boat. As a matter of fact, he was the first Australian to sail around Cape Horn in a private vessel back in 1966. He was up uh, looking on a beautiful race boat, uh, Morgan designed race boat called Panacea. And um, I, um, I asked if I could come aboard the boat and go sailing with him. And he looked down at me because he was six foot three and kind of looked at me, so if you want to come with me. But long story short, Andy, uh, Andy and I got married two years later, took off on our honeymoon on the 30 foot boat that he had built himself in Australia. Uh, it was a timber boat. Um, it had no toilet ladies, okay? It had a one burner kerosene stove. I slept on the cabin sole with the keel step mast between my legs. Uh, um, and our honeymoon was spent crossing the Atlantic, going over to Europe. I mean, doesn't everybody have a honeymoon like that? Uh, and that's when I really learned how to sail. Andy Wall, never wanted to have uh, a passenger aboard the boat. He wanted to have a co-captain and he taught me just about everything I know that I can pass along to you today. We spent uh, three years sailing around Europe, came back across the Atlantic together and knew we wanted a bigger boat because this little boat, you know, it would have sunk if it had another potato chip aboard it. Um, we sold our boat to a really good friend uh, Billy Nance, some of you might have known Bob Nance with Nance mm -hmm. and Underwood. Well, Billy Nance was Bob's older brother, and he took um, uh, he took little carronade uh, from us, and we went out to California, and we built the first fiberglass Freya that was design designed by uh, Magnus Halverson in Australia. Uh, for those of you who are racing fanatics like my husband, back in the 60s, Freya won the Sydney Hobart race three times in a row. And that's why he always wanted to build a Freya. So we built a Freya in our, literally in our backyard. Um, and then finally took off to sail around the world with the boat half finished. And our two little crew members, Samantha and Jamie, 
were four and seven when we left. We spent seven years sailing around the world. Came back home, um, started Andy's rigging business. Uh, I worked for Nansen Underwood for, for many years. And then, um, then we sailed our kids over to Europe. We spent a, a season sailing over to Europe, came back again. Spent the next season sailing over to Europe, come back again. And uh, some tragedies befell me, but I'm not going to go into them. I lost my husband, Andy, uh, and I lost my daughter, Samantha. Uh, but I was working at West Marine and had a wonderful job there. And that's where I started giving seminars. They sent me around the country giving seminars. And that's where it all started, Josh, really. And it all started also with Dave Walters Yachts because I knew David very well and his son worked at West Marine with me. And um, it's kind of full circle, isn't it? But our yachting community is full circle. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Pam, you've been such a, such a, a, a hallmark and a staple in the sailing community. You know, uh, I mean, your background, your story. Um, I mean, it's really humbling, Pam. I mean, you really are. You're an incredible human being. And we're just thrilled to see that you can that you're, you're, you're so generous with your knowledge and your experience, uh, you know, and I think you hit the nail on the head. The sailing community more so than, than you know, other segments of the, of the, of the boating community. Uh, I think everybody shares a very common thread and whether you're, uh, you know, the one that's sailing off on the, uh, the Oyster 82 or the, the, the 40 year old Valiant 40, uh, everybody I think has a very common approach to this, uh, common personality on many levels. and. Uh, uh, Pam, you're just so well-rounded with everything that you've done and you've experienced. So we're just uh, really excited to be putting on this seminar with you today. So, you know, uh, it's, it's really interesting uh, during this sort of uh, global crisis that we're in now. I've had more contact with friends around the world because of communication. Uh, and it's been just wonderful. Um, I have been able to speak to people in New Zealand, Brazil, uh, the Galapagos Islands, uh, over in Europe. And it's just, it's just marvelous how uh, the communication that you have set up for us all today uh, is something that we all can appreciate so much. Yeah. Well, we're, uh, we're very happy to be doing this. So, um, Pam, why don't you go ahead and get your PowerPoint pulled up here, get your presentation. And while you're getting that ready, I'm going to go over uh, a little bit on the format and how our audience can interact with Pam while we're going about this, because we definitely want this to be a two-way street. So we would love to hear everybody's, uh, um, everybody's input, your questions, of course. We have, uh, or, uh, we've got 102 people tuning in right now, so uh, I expect there's probably going to be a lot of questions and a lot of chat back and forth. We're going to do everything we can to get to everybody's questions. Um, if you are familiar with Zoom, or even if you're not, you should see a little menu option down there. You should see a, uh, an icon that says Q&A. So that's going to be the best method for uh, proposing your questions to, to Pam. Uh, but you can also use the, uh, the, the website uh, or the webinar chat function as well. So uh, try to use the Q&A, but if, if, if you find the, the chats easier, that's okay as well. So. All right. Um, let's see. Pam, do you have everything all set there for you? The, the, uh, my screen is showing the beginning slide, so I, I hope you can see it too. So if you go to, go to screen share. Oh, boy. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Can you see it now? There we are. Now we've got it. Okay, now I've just got to get the slideshow from the beginning. Mm -hmm. There we are. How's that? Perfect. We are <laughs> good, Pam. <laughs> well, thank you, Josh, because I can, I can tell everybody one thing. I might love sailing and sort of know what I'm doing aboard a boat, but I have absolutely zero knowledge of computers. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I've been uh, hoping that Josh can uh, lead me through this very well, and you have very much. Thank you, Josh. So with that, I'd like to um, I just begin by telling you uh, the one, one thing that I learned, uh, one of the many things that I learned from doing all the sailing that I've done, is that a lot of people have great ideas. And uh, 
you know, the greatest thing that I can uh, say is that if someone takes an idea that I use that has worked for me and then it works for them, then I feel really good about it. And as we sail through different uh, places around the world, uh, I, I learned so much along with my husband, Andy, um, from other people. And what I'm going to present to you today mostly is probably 75% Andy Wall, uh, who of course I learned everything from. And uh, the rest of it is from other people, other boats that we've seen. And I want to share some of these things with you because what I'm gonna show you has worked for us and um, it may even, it may work from you, for you. And so these are just a bunch of good ideas that um, have stood a, a lot of testing by me and Andy. And, um, you know, I wanna, I wanna have the opportunity to tell you about them and see if they'll work for you. Now, you don't have to agree with me on what, what this is, but I'm just gonna give you ideas. That's all I'm going to do. And, you know, I am not an expert in anything. I'm just gonna tell you what, what has worked for us. So uh, there's the real me. What you see on the little screen is not the real me. The real me is behind uh, the helm of my boat, Kendarik. People always ask me what Kendarik means. And one of the first things I'm going to say to people is never, never name your boat a difficult name that people can't get right away. Because when you're on the radio, and you have a strange name, uh, what I always have to do is say Kilo, Alpha, November, Delta, Alpha, Romeo, India, Kilo. And of course, uh, that takes time, and then people say, could you repeat it again? And my boat's name, Kendarik, actually Kendarik is the Aboriginal cave dwelling painting of a kangaroo that taught the Aborigines how to dance. So don't forget, my husband was from Australia. The design is an Australian boat. We had to name it an Australian name. I would have much preferred the Pamela W, but I didn't win that, uh, that discussion. So Ken Darick, um, I've been called Ken of Garlic, so you can call me that too. But there I am, the real me. Uh, there's a picture of her. She's 39 feet overall, flush deck, canoe stern. Uh, we, we literally built her in our backyard. Uh, actually, we drove out to California where there was a mold for a Freya, a young Australian had, brought the mold, had built a mold out in California. We drove out there, laid up the hull, put in the ballast, the internal ballast, put in a, a fake deck, and then shipped her back to Fort Lauderdale where we were able to uh, spend the next literally 10 years never completing her. She still isn't finished. But after about 10 years, we said, you know, if we don't get going, we're never going to get out of here. And that's one of the things I must tell you about is do it while you can. So wait a second, here we go. Next slide. There she is from the water. This is a picture just taken very, very recently down on Biscayne Bay. I, you know what? What person can talk about their boat? without their heart going like, you know, thumping with, with pride and joy. That's I'm sorry, I have a lot of pictures here, but I'll tell you what, she is part of my family. There she is. This is in the Tuamotu Islands. I just love this picture because this picture was taken back in 1987 in French Polynesia and notice there is no roller furling on her. No roller furling because there wasn't any roller furling in those days. And when we came home, and my husband Andy became a rigger. What was the first thing we did when we got home? We put on a, a roller furling system because believe it or not, on a 39 foot boat with four people living aboard full time, uh, we carried 17 different headsails, 17 different headsails and we used every single one of them. So whenever we had to change sail, we'd have to flake the one that we were taking down on deck, put it down below and of course put up the next sail. But uh, I just thought it would be interesting for you to, to see what a boat looked like without roller furling. Um, as you can see, she's got a long keel, big cutaway up forward, big barn door rudder on her stern. Uh, now this boat won the Sydney Hobart race, this, this hull design, three times in a row. This boat, I know that some people will say, uh, oh, I bet she doesn't turn or anything like that. This boat with that big 
barn door rudder with a cutaway forward. She will turn in her own length. There's something about this design that this boat, you put the helm over, you use your prop wash, and she just spins right around just like a thin keel. But I just want you to know that, of course, I'm very proud of her. But now what we're going to do is we're going to discuss a few things that have worked for us, and we're gonna start from the bow, we're gonna go work aft, and then we're gonna go down below. And again, uh, Josh, if you have any questions, if anybody wants to ask me anything, please help me with that because I can't see the, the, the screen. Yep. And um, if I go too fast or people don't understand, please, please, please let me know. Okay, so, sounds good. Pam, I do have, a, I've got a couple of questions that have come in, but um, probably something uh, to be addressed later in the chat. So I'm gonna read them to you real quick so you can okay. read them if that's okay. All right, so. Sure. Um, I've got one question, and this was one actually I had emailed to you. Um, this was from uh, Martin, and he asks, uh, Pam, would you think, uh, or, or, or what do you think are the most useful technological advances for cruisers among the following, uh, any that you feel have significantly advanced cruisers' lives, um, uh, and some that are perhaps overrated? And he brings up water makers, AIS, sail furlers, new generation anchors, effective solar systems, lithium ion batteries, sat communication, <laughs> electronic charting and navigation, and some of the new line uh, materials such as Dyneema and Spectra. So maybe we can, when you get to those items, just uh, talk a little bit about what you think might be hype and what might be really relevant. So good question. Okay, okay, just really quickly, I have to say hello to Martin and John on the most beautiful Hylos 54 called Genevieve, who's down in the Virgin Islands, making me very jealous because they're at anchor in seclusion there, and I am sitting here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So hi, Martin and John. I will get to that. Thank you, Josh. Go ahead. All right. Um, and then the other one is from David, and he's asking about uh, when we think the uh, Abacos will be ready to visit again. So I'm sure we'll talk about some cruising destinations. So. Sure. Sure. Well, uh, we'll get to those. Um, first of all, let me let me answer Martin's question first because it's it's pretty involved, and then we're gonna we're gonna start at the bow and move back. Uh, as Martin knows, uh, all the sailing that I have done has been without anything electronic except a, a ham radio. Okay. Um, so to me, every single thing that he listed there is not absolutely necessary for me, for me. As a matter of fact, I hardly, I don't have many of those things and I've never missed them. However, would I, if I had a bigger boat, would I uh, want to put many of those things, if not all of them aboard the boat? Or even a moderate sized boat, like you said, a Valiant 40, a boat my size? Sure, if I had the, um, if I had the ability to put whatever I wanted on my boat now, I think the very first thing that I would put on it is the AIS. I think that has really made a huge difference. Uh, of course, that's to say also, I better, I better put a GPS on and, and maybe a chart plot or two. But if I had to put something on my boat uh, today, I would put the AIS, okay? Um, all the other things really depend on what you want to have for the safety, the comfort, and the, and the ability to use computers. And to know also that if you had a complete electrical failure, what would you do if you lost many of those items? So, um, and if you didn't have a huge battery bank uh, and you used all these electronic devices, you have to be sure that your battery bank can supply the energy to, to be able to use all these products. So um, it, it's hard for me, Martin, to answer that question because I don't use them, I don't have them. Uh, however, if I had a bigger boat, if I had better batteries, if I had the space, and if I had the knowledge to use them properly, I probably would have every single one of them aboard. So I hope that answers your question. Do you need every single one of them aboard? 
No, you don't. You can get along. It's, it's, it's really what you're comfortable with, what your comfort zone is, and what you want to have, and what you can afford to have as well as space, money, and amperage. I hope that answers the question, sort of. What do you think, Josh? I think you, uh, you, you hit the nail on the head there, Pam. I think uh, a lot of it also, like you said, you, you touched on it, is, is budget. Not everybody has the budget to be able to put a, a lithium ion battery system in and full satellite uh, communication equipment, um, the latest and greatest electronics. You know, there's still boats out there that have good old Raymarine ST60 units in them from 20 years ago, and they'll be here in another 10 years. So, you know, it's it's... It's not always just the latest and greatest equipment, but it's also, you know, what your budget can allow in prioritizing what you need for your cruising. So good answer though, Pam. I like it. <laughs> That's yeah, why it's also proud. a matter of space too. Yeah. You know, we were talking about uh, space too. You know, you have to have the space, you have to have the area to put it in the boat where it's going to work efficiently. So all of those things have to be taken into consideration. But the one thing that, that, that if you've ever been struck by lightning, uh, you will know that you've got to be able to get along without them uh, and, and know what to do if you do have a complete electrical failure. That's just something to remember, you know. So, okay, Martin, we can talk about this forever because uh, I know your boat's got so many wonderful things on it, especially that anchor. By the way, um, Josh, I, I uh, sort of... Um, suggested to Martin to get a really big anchor and not only did he get a big one but he got a stainless steel one and um, if Martin could type and say tell you he named it the Pam so <laughs> <laughs> aptly named I like it <laughs> <laughs> I think I've done a good job over the years for him too okay <laughs> I mean my namesake has done a good job for him That's okay right. let's talk let's let's um begin talking about um a few things starting at the bow of the boat. Um, how many people here who are listening in like to wake up in the same place they anchored the night before? I hope everybody's raising their right hand and saying me. Okay, so I, um, I did work at West Marine for over 22 years. And um, I saw, of course, every aisle. I became familiar with every aisle. And when you came to the anchor aisle, uh, at West Marine, it had a great big sign over the top of, of, of how you choose the right anchor. But the main thing that they used to choose the right anchor for your boat was the length of your boat. So if, it, if your boat was, say, uh, 10 to 20 feet, you'd choose this anchor. If it was 20 to 35 feet, you'd choose this anchor and everything. Well, obviously, whoever made those signs had never been out cruising um, because there are so many other considerations to take into account what anchor is best for you. As a matter of fact, my husband Andy used to say, an anchor is like a wife. If she works for you, she's the best one. So I am not gonna, I'm not gonna recommend an anchor, but I'm going to suggest a few things to take into account when you are choosing an anchor for your particular uh, cruising grounds, the particular boat that you have, like a particular latitude where you're gonna be going, um, all this has to be taken into account because different anchors, different kinds of anchors hold better in some kinds of bottoms, okay? Uh, different anchors, of course, uh, have different styles for different kinds of bottoms. And then you have to take into account, does your boat have high top sides with a lot of windage? Do you have a catamaran that's got double the windage because you've got two hulls? And then you've got to take into account where you're going to be, what latitudes are you going to be sailing in? Are you going to be sailing in the high latitudes where there's generally, more, you know, speaking, there's a lot more wind than in, in the lower latitudes? Um, so what I always used to suggest to people, not that I wanted them to spend more money, but because I wanted them to wake up in the same place that they anchored, no matter what the conditions, what kind of boat they had or anything like that, was just get the next bigger size. Just get the next bigger size from what those specs of, above the, the anchor uh, lane would be uh, in, any, in any place where you can purchase any kind of anchor. Now, anchors are very personal. Um, I have this Delta. If I were to buy the anchor that they suggested for my 39-foot sloop, I would have 
chosen a 35 pound anchor. This is a 55 pound anchor. And uh, you know, there are so many wonderful designs today uh, that all work very well. Uh, I would never trade them for this anchor uh, because it works for me. It works for me. So a couple of things just to, to, to uh, tell you why it works is because the point part of this plow style anchor is filled with lead, which means when it drops down, when you deploy it and hits the seabed, 999% of times that it will, it will start digging in the minute it hits because of the lead that is embedded into the point of this anchor, okay? And it's not like the old CQR. Every, we, we sail around the world with a CQR. If you want mine, I'll give it to you, but put it in the garden, okay? Don't use it on your boat. Every time it would drop where we could watch it, it would drop on its side, and you'd have to back down a lot to be able to get it to flip over and start the, the, the actually digging in. But anchors, I would always suggest the next biggest size, and if it works for you, great. Uh, and, and, and use that one. But I also want to caution you, if you have a secondary anchor or a tertiary anchor, actually we carry six anchors around the world with us, get different styles. And that's because where you're anchoring sometimes, uh, could be sand, could be coral, could be mud, could be rock, uh, and could be, you know, conch grass like in the Bahamas. So you also have to sometimes switch anchors depending on where you are, uh, just to be compatible with the digging in power of the seabed that you're gonna be anchoring in. So we have six different anchors, they're all different kinds. Um, I can tell you what some of them are, but the best secondary anchor that we carry is a little 20 pound high tensile Danforth style anchor. And the reason that is so good because it's portable and we can put it in the dinghy and take it out to wherever we want it, if we want it to uh, catch us off when we run aground, if we want to have a, a, a breast line that's going out from the side, if uh, it, it uh, blows up in the middle of the night and we want to put a secondary anchor out, we want to put it out quickly, we can put that in the dinghy, go up to windward and put it out. That little 20 pound high tensile, it has to be the high tensile damper, which is welded flukes. In other words, not bent flukes, but welded flukes is the greatest little secondary anchor uh, a boat of our size and our weight uh, can have aboard. Then we have a fisherman. Then we have a huge big fortress. We also carry a Paul Luke 65 pound hurricane anchor that comes in three pieces that is stored, taken apart and down and lashed in the bilge. We have uh, the Bahamian style anchor that's made out of rebar. So if we're in a place where there's a lot of coral, we can actually with the strength of the windlass, pull it up and away from the coral. Anyway, that's my take on anchors, and I hope it helps some of you a lot. Also, I wanna show you in this picture, just very quickly, is we have a big protruding anchor platform. And people say, well, why, why do you want that? Well, uh, if this anchor was right off the bow of our boat, instead of in this anchor platform, the, the pointy end of that, that would hit into our, our boat and we want it to be way out there so that when we deploy and when we retrieve the anchor, the anchor swings a little bit, it's not gonna chip our boat up on the bow of the boat. Pam, Any questions uh, on that? Yeah, Pam, so uh, Georgia has a question here yeah. and asking, uh, aside from anchors, how do you feel about road versus chain and what can you speak to about chain lengths? Okay, that's a really good question. Thank you very much for asking it. Um, actually, I'm going to get to that, but just very briefly, if you're a, a yacht that's cruising around a lot of different places in the world, uh, I would definitely go to all chain for the daily use or the, you know, the often use. Uh, what we carried sailing around the world on a 39-foot boat, and don't forget, uh, all boats are sensitive to weight, uh, we carried 300 feet of 3 8 triple B chain backed up by, if we needed it, uh, 300 feet of 5 8 mega braid uh, so that if we were anchored in 90 feet, say, in Fiji 
uh, or New Caledonia or something like that. And we wanted, you know, at least five to one scope, at least, depending on the weather conditions, the sea state where we were anchoring, uh, we could put out 10 to one if we were in a hurricane, something like that. So we carry all chain. The one good thing about chain is it adds extra weight to the holding power of your anchor. Also, it keeps you from drifting around. If you have nothing but, let's just say, the length of your boat of chain attached to all rope road, uh, boats tend to sail around on the anchorage, on the, on the, I'm sorry, on the anchors, uh, because they don't have the chain that's going straight down to the seabed. Normally, in normal conditions, uh, our, our anchor chain doesn't even come out straight, even in, in strong wind because of the weight of the chain. So I prefer just chain, but if I don't have enough chain for the depth that I'm anchoring in and to make me feel comfortable with the amount of scope I'm putting out, I have it backed up by another 300 feet of a very good line, which is the Mega Braid line, which is my uh, line of choice. And when we get to that, I will tell you why. I hope that um, helps you a little bit. Now, if you're just day sailing, uh, going across the bay, spending maybe a weekend on the boat, uh, a, a length of chain ink, you know, attached to Nylon Road is just fine. But that's because you probably are familiar with what the seabed is like and, and you know the area. And uh, I, just, I, I just prefer the heavy chain. Right. We're gonna talk more about that as we move aft. Perfect, thanks Pam. Yeah, any other questions Josh before I move on? Uh, we've got a couple here, but I think they'll be probably more relevant later on in the in the chat. We're still looking about uh, talking about the Abacos, the cruising grounds. Um, oh yes. <laughs> asking about, uh, I've got a question here about uh, folding props and uh, recommendations for keeping a sextant aboard and knowing how to use it. So okay, we'll, good. Well, we're going to get to all of those things, but I might divert maybe once when I think of it and and, sure. uh, and come back. Gun track. I got you. All great questions. All great questions. Now I want to I want to show you a picture here, and I want everybody who's got a sailboat with a mast in and with a head stay to listen to me very carefully. Okay. What this arrow is pointing to, from my chain plate to the link plates of my roller furling, is called a double jaw toggle. In nomenclature, it's called a DJT. Now, I want you all to think of your sailing along with your Genoa out, okay? And you've got your head stay attached somehow to your chain plate on the bow, okay? And what's happening to that head stay as you are sailing? Well, if you're sailing into the wind and you're beating, the head stay is going back and forth a little bit, correct? you know, as you go off a wave and bounce down. But most of the time, your head stay is sagging to leeward just a bit. Sagging to leeward. I mean, I'm not talking about a lot, I'm talking about a little bit. Now, I have seen on so many boats, no double jaw toggles. And what this means is, the articulation of the head stay attachment to the chain plate can only revolve on one circular clevis pin, whether it's the forward movement or the sideways movement. A double jaw toggle, as you can see in this picture, has two big clevis pins. One, where the arrow is pointing, allows the head stay to move forward and aft. And the one on the bottom of the DJT allows the head stay to move sideways, port and starboard. And being a rigger's wife, being a rigger's wife, how many times have I helped Andy replace a head stay that broke right down at the chain plate because of metal fatigue and the attachment from either the wire or the toggle or the link plates of the head stay have not been able to articulate all four directions, fore and aft and port and starboard. And that has created over years, metal fatigue. And then all of a sudden one day you hear a bang and your head stay is gone from the bottom. So everybody should go and look and make sure that their head stay has this ability to pivot port and starboard and forward and aft. And I guarantee you, 
it will help you out in the future uh, so that there is no metal fatigue on that head stay. Does that make sense to everybody? Josh, any questions on that? No, that's well put, Pam. Um, just a real quick reminder of something. When Andy and I were in uh, Bayona, Spain, there was a race that was going across the Atlantic and there was 56 boats of all different nationalities in Bayona and uh, they were delayed four days because of a southwesterly gale. And of course, where were they heading? They were heading for like across the Atlantic, so they would have been going into, uh, they were gonna be beating into a southwesterly gale. Well, after the fourth day, everybody got antsy, wanted to get going, so they went out in this gale anyway, all 56 boats. Um, about oh, 11 hours later, all 56 boats came back into Bayona, and half of them had lost their head stays. And when Andy and I walked down the dock looking at the bows of these boats, it was because every boat that lost its head stay did not have a double jaw toggle. The boats that had the double jaw toggles, everything was fine. So it's not just me telling you about this, it's practical things that I, I have witnessed. That was the biggest one uh, that I ever saw. And I'll tell you what, it makes a believer out of you. It makes a believer out of you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, anyway, even if your boat does not come with a double jaw toggle, you know, before you rig it or when you take it out for the, if you take the mast out to, to uh, you know, maintain it or something like that, you can always put one of these in. Okay, moving along. Oops, what's going on here? There we go. What is this called? These are called link plates. Oftentimes you don't see these on roller furlings. Uh, what you see is the drum that's right down at the bottom, uh, just on top of the chain plate for the head stay. But every single roller furling system has as an option, these link plates that raise up the drum off of the, off of the chain plate right down by your deck. And it's used for three really good reasons. One is, how could I deploy this anchor, the stock of this anchor, if that roller furling drum was right down at the bottom attached to the chain plate? I would have to move it over to the side and then lift it up and deploy it and make sure it doesn't hit that drum and damage it. Same thing when I'm retrieving it. The stock of that anchor, when it comes up, would hit the roller furling drum. Somebody would have to be up there and move it around to allow the anchor to come up and not hit your roller furling drum. The other things that are really good about it are, look where this is, look where, look where, can, does, does my pointer work on this? I don't know. But look where the tack, the tack of the roller furling genoa is. Where is it? It's above the bow pulpit, which means you're not gonna get chafe on the sail, and it also means that the foot of the sail, you can look underneath it. If you're the person on watch, you can stand up from the cockpit and look underneath it. So in other words, it eliminates the chafe on the Genoa up at the tack area, and it allows you to see underneath it. Now that's, of course, if you're not a racing enthusiast who wants to have this Genoa right down on the deck, the foot of the Genoa right not down on the deck. But that's another really, uh, another really good reason for it. Yep. So, um, yeah, David. Uh, David has a good question here. So, what's your sure. opinion of below deck roller furling? Uh, advantages, disadvantages? Um, well, it certainly cleans up the fore deck, doesn't it? <laughs> it really does. However, as long as you keep a good maintenance schedule on it, you know, sometimes what you see, if it's buried and you can't look at it every day, could have some rust problems or or screws backing out problems or things like that. Uh, I prefer to have it on deck so that I can see it every day that I'm up there. Uh, when we're sailing, we do a complete deck check every every you know six or eight hours. Uh, and I don't think if I was beating to windward, I'd want to open up the deck hatch to look to see if my roller furling drum was okay. That's the only thing that I can see that might be um, a negative of having it down below. However, of course, it certainly cleans up the foredeck. Does that answer his question? I mean, if it doesn't, please tell me. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think you addressed it well. And David, if you have any anything else you'd like to amplify on that, just let us know, and uh, and we'll we'll certainly get to it. But uh, good right. answer. Right. Also, you know, I like it when it rains. I get a, a nice fresh water wash down on my on my roller flowing system. If it was down below and it was wet in a, in a locker, and I didn't see it and I hadn't uh, cleaned it off with fresh water occasionally, of course there's going to be more corrosion. Of course there's going to be more corrosion. So that th those are just the two things. Okay. Um, so those are the two things I wanted to bring to your attention with these the, the link plates. Actually, three things: the chafe. The being able to see underneath the Genoa and of course being able to deploy the anchor easily. Now, how many people here, well, you don't have to answer the question because there's so many of you, but uh, these closed chocks were something that we had to do to go through the Panama Canal. Now, don't forget, we went through the Pan Panama Canal back in 1985. The rules were really strict then and you had to have closed chocks. And there was a very good reason for it. Anybody who's been through the Panama Canal knows that you go down really fast when the locks are emptying and you're going up really fast and you've got to have a line handler uh, on four points of the boat, port and starboard up forward, port and starboard aft. And if you're not being careful and watching that line coming in or going out from a, a chalk that's got horns on it, if that line ever flipped out, especially when you were going down at a rapid rate and you're hanging on to it or you have you know one one little uh, la uh, 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 turn on the cleat which you should have so that you could stop it quickly you could take the whole bow pulpit off so the reason that they requested you to have closed chocks is so that there's no way that those line handlers could ever lose the line and get it out of control coming out of the horned shocks. I just wanted to let you know why that I why I have the arrow there. Not everybody has those and I'm, not, I'm sure that they don't make you take off the the horn chocks that you might have to put these on but it was a good safety feature that we we uh, certainly adhered to. Another thing that you could do if I were you and you did have horn chocks and you were going through these enormous uh, locks is to put a snatch block up there somehow and encapsulate the line that you're, you're, that you're either retrieving as you're going up or easing out as you're going down. I think that would be a really good way of encapsulating it. Okay, so we're gonna move on. I hope that, that answers that. That's to show you where the tack of the Genoa is. And of course, what it does, the tack of the Genoa is higher than the ball pulpit. I'm not sure why I have that, pick, that, that arrow, but um, there it is. Isn't that cool? I'm not sure why I put that arrow there. Now let's talk about, uh, let's keep going talking about our, our ground tackle. Uh, the greatest thing in the world that was ever uh, invented for me was an electric windlass because when we sailed around the world, we did not have a, an electric windlass. We had the old Simpson Lawrence 555 where every stroke just brought up a foot of chain and it took forever to get the chain up. But an electric windlass is fabulous, just fabulous. I want you to notice a couple of things in this picture. I want you to notice how far aft our windlass is. It's not right up in the bow there. It's way aft and we did that for two reasons. One was, first of all, we wanted to have a deep, deep, deep chain locker. And because I told you our boat is cut away up forward, up forward there, if we had put it up there, there wouldn't have been room for 300 feet of chain. And further aft we get, of course, the deeper the boat gets, so that the chain can go right down into a much deeper, deeper area. Also, we did not want all the chain up in the eyes of the boat. If you're being to windward, that's an awful lot of weight, way up forward. So our windlass is six feet back from the bow for the couple of reasons that I told you. A deeper chain locker so that you don't ever have the pyramiding effect of the chain when it comes in quickly. Coming aft, of course, it keeps the weight out of the eye of the boat. And of course, it gets it away from um, uh, the roller furling and the head stay so that we can work up there. So ours is also lifted up. You can see it's up an inch off the deck because when you're beating to windward on any boat, even though you have scuppers and the wind goes, I mean, the water goes aft that you might take on the deck, it, there's always a little bit of it swirling around and we don't want any of it to go down that hole 
uh, into the chain locker. So we lifted it up uh, on purpose so the swirling water um, can hopefully not go into that that uh, hose pipe where the where the chain goes down. By the way, I don't have a picture of it, but after we have left a harbor and we're going on a long passage, say across the Pacific, across the Atlantic, wherever, across the Indian Ocean, we carry silly putty in a Ziploc bag. And we shove the silly putty into that hose pipe hole so that it, 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 it sort of makes it more waterproof, okay? And the silly putty doesn't stick to it like clay would or anything like that. So you can use that up there uh, to make it much more watertight. Also, you see the snaps on the, the base plate there, that the snaps have a cover that you're gonna see in just a minute to cover it as well so that when we're thrashing to windward, we don't take, we hopefully don't take any water down the hose pipe. Um, gotta tell you really quickly, the same thing goes for windlasses as it does for the chain and the anchor that you're gonna use. I would overdo it. I mean, this, the, the, the way that manufacturers determine what windlass you need is by the weight of your ground tackle. So if I were to, to weigh my anchor and all my chain, and then I would multiply it times three, that would give me the right windlass to use, the number. Well, I, I, I'm a firm believer, just like with the anchors, you get the next bigger size. So the, the size for our boat would be a 2200. This is a maximum windlass. Uh, we got, we got the, 30, the 3500, and for one other really good reason, the bigger the windlass, the lower the gear ratio. It's kind of like going into low gear in a stick shift car when you're going up a mountain. The bigger the windlass, the slower it is, but the more powerful it is. So this windlass is more powerful than a smaller, a smaller model of the same company, uh, Maxwell. So in other words, we just wanted that extra margin as well, and that's why we got the bigger one. By the way, the footprint is exactly the same. The 2200 footprint is exactly the same as the 3500 footprint. So if you wanna upgrade a little bit, you can do it really easily. Um, this picture also just forward of this, and I'm gonna talk about this in a, in a couple of minutes, is another chain plate for a removable inner forestay. And I'll talk more about that later. By the way, both that chain plate and the windlass underneath it have huge stainless steel backup plates, huge big fender washers on the, the bolts that went through to spread the load of the windlass and of course the chain plate that's for the removable inner floor stay. Okay, so let's move on also to the left of, or to the port side of the windlass, you'll see another hose pipe cover there. And um, that hose pipe is for the secondary anchor if we ever wanna deploy it from the bow. It's got, in, underneath it, it's got a five gallon bucket and in it is 300 feet of 5 eighths mega braid and 50 feet of 3 8 chain already attached to it. So if we wanted to bring out a secondary anchor quickly and deploy it over the bow, it's all set to go right there up in the, in the bow of the boat. Any questions, Josh? I can answer about this. Well, let's see here. So we've got another question here, and I'm sure we're gonna be talking about rigging. So yes. um, Marcia asks, is there a preference between rod and wire rigging? So I'm sure we'll get to that. Yeah. Yes. Although very quickly, um, very quickly, um, it's it's hard to say because everybody who's got the rod rigging loves it. Everybody who's got the wire rigging mostly loves it. Okay. Uh, being a rigger's wife, the 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 bet the, the the best example of maintenance is that you can look at a swedge fitting or a Norseman fitting or a stay lock fitting. And you can tell if there's something wrong with it and you need to replace it. You can also tell if the wire, if a strand of wire is rusty and you need to replace it on wire rigging, okay? So it's visually, you can really see what maintenance you need to do on wire rigging. It's very difficult to see what maintenance that you need to do on rod rigging. Even though rod rigging is much a cleaner thing and everything like that, the only way you can tell if the rod rigging 
needs attention is to have it x-rayed. And then, of course, you've got to take it down and take it to an x-ray machine. Uh, unless that's changed now. Has that changed, Josh, since Andy was a rigger? Well, uh, you know, I know there's a you know, variety of different methods you can use, but like dye testing, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you you are exactly right. You know, I mean, rod rigging is certainly more challenging to spot defects than than the the traditional you know uh, strand rigging. So right. right. But then again, you know, the rod rigging is it's a stronger stronger um, structure. You know, I mean, now that it never it never it never stretches at all. You know, so yes, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I would say there's definitely pros and cons to each strength That's right. advantage in the rod rigging but uh you know the the serviceability and uh in, in maintenance perhaps of uh the traditional strand rigging but uh, right the other thing too is that like we carried a spare a spare uh, piece of wire with one stay lock on the bottom of it and uh not but we didn't have it on the other side so we we carried an over long piece of wire for the longest wire on our boat in case we lost some something if we lost any of the shrouds or the head stay or the back stay. And we could use that immediately to, you know, install a new one if we had to. Mm -hmm. we had, where it, you, it's not practical to carry a piece of rod ringing with you. you know? Yeah, exactly. And that almost leads into, you know, David just uh, has a, you know, brought up a, a, a question here about synthetic rigging, you know, Dyneema. Yeah. And, and I think oftentimes you're seeing that synthetic rigging being used in emergency situations to repair a broken rod or a broken piece of strand rigging. But you are also seeing a lot of, you know, some modern boats using completely synthetic rigging. Oh, and I got all the big catamarans now use it. You know, I'll, and imagine the weight it saves. You know, imagine the weight it saves. Okay, so uh, we're gonna move on a little bit here. Okay, th I just wanted to show you mega braid. I mean, everybody knows what three strand is. Everybody knows what double braid. And of course, there's, there's several different kinds of uh, a plaited braid like this. But to me, the New England ropes, uh, Mega braid is fantastic. This is 12 strands of line. It is always soft, pliable. It has it has no memory. It doesn't get stiff with age. And I can put 300 feet of 5 8 um, mega braid down that hawse pipe um, that you saw. Oops, let's go back. Down that hawse pipe. And without anyone being down there to pull it down, to stamp on it, to coil it or anything, it just collapses in a five gallon bucket. I just love Mega Braid, and I just think it's, it's, it's the best nylon line to have. It's very easy to splice, it's just like splicing three strand, except you've got 12 strands to splice. Um, it's, it's, it's marvelous stuff. Anyway, if anyone wants to talk to me about Mega Braid, let me know. Okay, let's just go on to some chain here. I want everybody to, to take a pencil and paper or, or a computer or something and write down the three kinds of chain that you can have on your boat because it's very important. There's, there's two kinds of chain you can have, either galvanized or stainless steel. Of course, galvanized is much less expensive and, and of course, much more available than stainless steel chain. But stainless steel chain has one wonderful thing that galvanized chain doesn't have. And that is being slippery when it comes into or goes out of your chain locker. Let's first of all talk about galvanized chain because that's what most people use. I don't know if anybody knows this or not, but I'm gonna give you a, a quick primer on chain. There are three kinds of galvanized chain that you can purchase today for your boat. One is called proof coil. Proof coil, is the least strong. It's a long, not very strong link. It is the least expensive. And the reason it's important for you to know this is because if you have a windlass with a gypsy and you're buying new chain and the gypsy is specific to a certain type of chain link, you have to be sure and get that if you've already got the gypsy on a windlass. Conversely, if you've got a windlass and you're buying chain, wait, or am I going back? Anyway, your chain has to be compliant with what the gypsy is on your, your windlass, okay? 
So when you buy a windlass, you have to know what the gypsy has and what size chain and what kind of length the chain holds. And if you have the gypsy already and you buy the chain, you've got to buy the chain that's compatible with the gypsy. Now, you can interchange them, but it'll cost you money. But if you buy them new and you know that in advance, you buy the windlass that's the same as your chain. And of course, if you're buying new chain, you buy the chain that's compatible with the windlass you already have. So let me tell you about proof coil. Proof coil galvanized chain is usually used on land, but because it's so inexpensive, some gypsies and some people use it on their boat. It will always have, if it's good quality chain, a G3. G3. Okay, in the chain link, like this says G4. So when I buy chain, or when I suggest to people, when I'm consulting with them to buy chain, I make sure that the chain that they buy has a stamp on it so that you know exactly what that link is. So this happens to be G4. So what is G4 chain? G4 chain is a very short, stubby, very strong link. And it is high test chain. If you are buying high test chain, what you can do is go down a diameter and have the same strength as a bigger diameter. So in other words, if I didn't want to use my 3 8 chain because I was very weight conscious and area or space conscious of my anchor locker, I would, instead of buying another size link, another kind of link like triple B or proof coil, and I'm gonna to come to triple B in a minute, I would get the smaller diameter, but just as strong G4 or high test or high tensile chain. And it will always have either a G4 or an HT stamped on it. Now what you do when you reduce the chain, of course, when you reduce the diameter of the chain, remember too that you're also reducing the weight and the space it takes up. So catamarans who have kind of shallow, sometimes shallow anchor lockers, okay, they will want to go to a smaller diameter with the same strength as the bigger diameter chain. Does everybody get that? Let me go to the next chain link besides the G4. So we've gone through proof coil, which is the least strong, the longest link, and it's always got a what? A G3 stamped on it, if it's good chain. The high test chain, which you can use a smaller diameter and have just the same strength as bigger diameter chain, is high test with an HT or a G4 on it. The chain that I use on my boat is called Triple B. It's always either got a 3B on it or it will have BBB. G, no, in other words, okay, G, no, it will have BBB or 3B. Now, the reason I chose that chain is because it's very strong. It's a small, short, stubby link like G4, and it's heavy, which is what I want on my anchor chain for my boat. And it's not as expensive as high test or G4 chain. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. So just to, to bring it back again, the least expensive chain is called Proof Coil. It will always have a, a G3 on it, okay? And it'll always be the, the weakest link or the weakest link manufacturer, okay? Then there's the Triple B, which is in the middle, the BBB or the 3B, which is the heavier weight and sh small, short, heavy, duty chain. And then there is the G4, which is the high test or HT on the, on the link, which is, of course, you can use a smaller diameter, less weight, and, and have the same strength as the thicker, more powerful triple B. Okay. Is that too confusing? <laughs> I hope not. not at all. Uh, let's see, Pam, I think we might have a question from uh, oh, my friend Paul. So I'm going to bring Paul in here real quick and um, by the way for for the attendees if you want to ask Pam a question 
There is a way where you can go into the uh, uh, participant list and uh, raise your hand, and we can actually get in, uh, in there and bring you on, uh, you know, voice live with Ham and ask your questions. So, Paul, I'm going to jump in here real quick, and let's see if we can get this to work here. Um, so, let's see, Paul, if uh, if you got a question here, you can unmute and uh, and ask it for Pam. Hi, Paul. I guess Paul's being shy. <laughs> Maybe I have to unmute it here. Do I have to unmute it? Nope, I think you're okay. Let's oh, see. Oh, okay, yeah, you're right. All right. So, Paul, if you, if you have your question, you can jump in here. But, all right, we'll keep going on then, Pam. Okay, well, just, just one last thing before we leave this is that don't forget that the chain has to be compatible with the gypsy. The gypsy has to be compatible with the chain, okay? Uh, now, one last thing is there is an alternative to shallow... Uh, uh, anchor lockers, okay, chain lockers, and that is stainless steel chain. That's why I said there is stainless steel chain. And stainless steel chain is excellent for anybody who's got a shallow chain locker because it cannot pyramid. It cannot stay up on itself and, and pyramid up to the top of your of the hole where the chain is going to come out. And I many, many catamarans now are using stainless steel chain. And even there was a Swan 53 um, that had a chain locker way up forward. And every time they brought the chain in, it would pyramid because it can't slide off itself and jam the hose pipe hole and jam the windlass. So I, I suggested the stainless steel chain and they said, Bob's your uncle, that works perfectly now. Does it cost more? Yeah, it does. But I have wonderful sources for chain. So if you wanna get chain, you can always come to me because boy, I get really good prices for the chain. Anyway, that's just uh, something for you to remember if you do have a problem with your chain locker. Okay, there's the cover for my um, windlass. Um, by the way, I just wanted you to know that I do the sewing on my boat and I'm a terrible seamstress. Uh, the first cover I made for the boat, I had the, uh, I think I've got an arrow here. Uh, I made the uh, Velcro that I could close it off with uh, facing forward. So the first big, you know, squally day, we were out beating to windward. The big sea came over and just opened it up and tore it apart, tore the snaps off and over the side it went. So I had to remember for the next one, I had to make sure that the closure was facing aft. So if water was coming off the bow, it would make it, it, would make it tighter rather than, of course, uh, open it up. So there's there's that that I wanted to show you. Um, I also wanted to show you one other thing really quickly. Uh, for those of you who want it, and I think this is a really good thing to have, this is just a little um, spigot for a hose that goes, that is plumbed into my um, head intake. Okay, it's plumbed into the, the hose for my head intake hose so that I don't have to put a separate uh, seacock or a separate through hull fitting in and I have a pump attached to it and I have one of those hoses that's um, uh, twirly so that it's very short and I use this of course uh, when I'm in a muddy anchorage a sandy anchorage or anything like that to always make sure that my anchor chain is really cleaned off before I let it go into my anchor locker use it all the time we also use it when we catch a fish and uh, we clean the fish on deck and there's all kinds of blood on the deck and and slime and stuff. Uh, we use that to hose the deck off at sea rather than throwing in a, a canvas bucket. Uh, we also use it to shower at sea. Um, if, uh, if we're short on fresh water, uh, we can use it, of course, as a nozzle shower uh, and to uh, bathe in, in salt water. So I just wanted to show that to you as well. Also, you see um, in this picture really quickly, I have varnished tow rails. Anybody who's got varnished tow rails, uh, it's got to be insane, okay, because <laughs> they require so much maintenance. Um, but what I did was I, I made um, some umbrella covers. It's got the white on the outside to reflect the UV rays, but it's dark blue on the inside, so that if I turned it over, you'd see it was dark blue uh, to keep the varnish from having the UV come through the white uh, into the varnish. And then I just used shower stall clips, you know, for a shower curtain and cut off the little knobs that close them up, that snap them closed, and I put that on my varnish when my boat is here at my dock so that uh, <laughs> I don't have to varnish as often. 
just just a little tip. I just wanted to show you how far aft my windlass is. This is way far aft. As you can see, it's going way down into the into the into the bow of the boat. There is no way in the world that my chain can pyramid here. I've got the 300 feet of chain in there easily. Okay. Also, I'm able to maintain my windlass very easy without having to crawl up into the forepeak of the boat. The forepeak of the boat in this picture, just so you know where the curtains are closed, carries nothing but lightweight things like deflated fenders, empty jerry cans. Um, I put in uh, toilet paper rolls. Before, that reminds me of the toilet paper thing. Uh, uh, in, in double plastic bags, put them up there to use. Uh, paper towels, because they're lightweight. I put them in plastic bags up there. So everything that's stowed up forward in the bow of my boat where I don't want a lot of weight is very lightweight, except for the, the two uh, anchor roads that I also keep up there that have just a little bit of chain, but mostly it's the Mega Braid line, which isn't very heavy. Okay, so I want to ask one person to answer this. What is wrong with this picture? I'm on a mooring. That's a hint. What is wrong with this picture? Josh? Let's see. I'm waiting. Uh, we're waiting oh, on somebody anybody here. Guess. Somebody, can, somebody in the live audience of 104 people, <laughs> I think, can probably send us an opinion on what they view to be wrong here. And they'll go, oh, no. Uh, no, no chaff protection. That's David. That's it. That's yep. it. There we go. Okay. He got it. He got it. Oh, I mean, this is a disaster yeah, waiting to happen. Yeah. Uh, and then strain relief. That's another good one. And no yeah. stubber. So. Well, and first of all, you never, never, never put a, any mooring line or anchor line around your windlass like that. Yeah. Your windlass is not a cleat. Okay. It should be going on a cleat. All right. A yeah. windlass isn't made to take that kind of, you know, pull just like, you know, you, you have your chain stoppers up forward to keep the chain from pulling on your windlass. Okay, so at least someone, um, well, thank you had, guys. I hope everybody had, noticed had, that. We had a good number of, uh, of, of good responses there. So David was first to the punch on the, on the chaff right. protection. Uh, and then uh, uh, we had, uh, should use a bridle. Um, again, yep, chaff protection. Right. Chaff protection. That's right. And it shouldn't go around the windlass. Yep, uh, anchor lines not secured to a cleat. Yep. Uh, strain relief and no snubber. So a good response. Right. Actually, this is a mooring. This is a mooring ball, but but that's it. But now um, I, I also want to show you one thing in this that's that's very important. Notice how the anchor platform, which goes straight out from the bow, okay, also has two pieces attached to the forward chain plate. And this is this is an engineering thing that everybody should think of. Instead of having something sticking out there, just like a platypus duck tail, you know, or something like that, when you're in a sea and the boat is bobbing up and down and you've got, let's just say, 300 feet of chain out, it's a lot of weight, the boat's going up and down, what is that doing to your anchor platform out there if you didn't have those two struts attached to something in the bow of the boat? It's causing metal fatigue, I'll answer the question. It's again causing metal fatigue. And that is why when you triangulate something like this, any engineer would know that that ball pulpit is not gonna collapse or cave in or have metal fatigue because it can't move from the, from the pressure of the chain that might be pulling it up and down. I'm only talking about, you know, if you're anchored in a place where the bow is bobbing up and down and you're constantly getting this heavy anchor chain pulling it down. So that's something to keep in mind if you're if you are if you're going to make your own or you're going to have a bow pulpit made. Also in this picture, I just want you to see see how high up the tack is on the on the uh, Genoa. Uh, here's another thing I want to ask you: Why would my why would my running lights be up on the bow pulpit rather than down, molded into the hull? One word only: visibility. Visibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you don't have your running lights up high, and they're down low, you're not going to be able to see them. Okay, and, I just and to Paul, Paul pointed out something uh, that is pretty visible here in this photo, and that is uh, uh, where you pin your anchor to secure it. Now, obviously, you're on a mooring here, so you're not sailing right. while you're sailing to be able to secure that anchor. 
Right. We yeah. do have we do have the pin, but guess what? The pin on the uh, the anchor doesn't fit the pin that we made on the. <laughs> so what we just we just tie it off now with a piece of line, but we still use the holes that are in the bow pulpit, you know, to tie it off. Okay, and then of course uh, the chain is left on. The chain is left on around the gypsy, around the windlass. But we always take another line on the anchor, and take a line and and cleat it off to a cleat that is up on the bow. This is when we're at sea. This is when we're at sea. So the anchor isn't trying to pull, you know, the anchor chain around the gypsy. Okay. Okay, we're not getting very far. I just wanted to show you these two, I think, uh, these two switches on the deck. One, of course, is to retrieve the chain with an electric windlass, okay? And the other one is actually to deploy the chain. Now, um, these are the plastic ones that came with it. These have been on a circumnavigation and two transatlantics, and I just got to show you something. Uh, wait a second. I want to show you what we've replaced it with. I don't want you to think that I've let those cracked, horrible things up there. Whenever I have um, a consultation with a boat, like with Martin and John on that beautiful Hylus Genevieve, I give them a present, and I give them these Maxwell stainless steel uh, foot foot pedal foot 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 button uh, covers to put on their boat. These are now on my boat, well over ten years old. I have never polished them, ever. And look at that stainless steel. They're not expensive. Not only do they dress up the the whole foredeck, but let's see if I can go back. No, let's see. Let me go back with this one. I was going to go back and show you those horrible. Oops. The plastic ones that rot in the sun but of course they were pretty old to rot in the sun so if anybody wants to consult with me and they don't have them they will be a present from Pam and I have to get them from New Zealand I have to order them for, from New Zealand it takes exactly 10 days to get them okay. anyway that's just a little uh, an aside yep so, hey, I think we've got a we've got a question here from sure. uh, Stefan Stefan I'm gonna call on here and uh, I've just unmuted you so if you'd like to ask Pam your question you can go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask it away. Let's see. Oh. Stefan? Yeah, I don't oh. have any questions. Oh, all right. <laughs> no questions, just raising the hand. Okay, thanks anyways. All right, Pam, we'll keep going. Okay, well, I just wanted to point out that this is the, the chain plate for that removable inner spore stay that I'm gonna talk about later. And I wanted to point it out to you that it's got a toggle on it too, don't forget. And the bottom of the, the uh, inner forestay that attaches to that also has a toggle on it so that it can rotate port and starboard fore and aft. Just wanted you all to know that, okay? Okay. So there is the removable inner forestay. As you can see, I don't use a staysail. Uh, unless it's heavy weather. The reason I use a staysail in heavy weather is because I do not like reefing my Genoa. I was a sailmaker with Mac Shaw Sailmakers for years. Well, I wasn't a sailmaker, I ran the office. But I also know that Genoas are made out of lighter weight material normally than staysails. And what happens when you're in, let's just say the wind gets over 15, over 18, and you really want to take a reef in a roller flow in Genoa, which is possible, which is, is done all the time. But what happens to the clue of a Genoa when you roll it up a little bit, when you take a couple of rolls in it, or if you take more than a couple of rolls? The clue gets higher and higher. What does that do to the stability of the boat when you're sailing? What does it do? It makes, it makes the force of effort making the boat heel over, get what? Higher and higher, right? Are you with me with that? Okay. <laughs> also, what if your sail is made with something like seven and three quarter ounce or eight ounce Genoa material, which is not made for anything over 18 knots? You're going to actually spoil the shape of your Genoa because what you're doing is you're using a lightweight sail in heavy weather. And the lightweight sail was made for light weather sailing. 
So what we do instead is we have a staysail. A lot of boats already have staysails, permanent staysails on their boat, which is brilliant. We don't have one because our foredeck isn't that big. We're not that big a boat, okay? Besides that, we like tacking into anchorages and scaring the bohulies out of people by coming right under their sterns and, and waving to them and saying hi. We like to do a lot of, um, what shall I say, um, tacking with our, with our big Genoa. And if we had that staysail up there all the time, we'd always have to get that, that when we tacked, or when we jived, it doesn't matter, we'd still have to get that clue around that staysail. But if we only had a small sail that was heavy weight, heavy material that we could use and not, not hurt our Genoa or not make the boat heal more, that's what we wanted. So we put a removable inner forestay with this forestay release lever that is just tied off to the side, no tension on it, and available to use very quickly. In this case, you'll see where it's attached to that little eye in the turnbuckle or in the chain plate there. You'll see it's got the other toggle that will go onto the toggle that I showed you on the foredeck. So it has the motion sideways and forward and aft. So what we have is a hank on staysail, heavyweight material, very low cut, very low cut along the deck. And of course, it's what we use in heavy weather. Any questions, quick questions on that or I'll move on. Also note the rigging on this um, also. Uh, look at the two turnbuckles and you'll see that these turnbuckles rotate forward and aft and the toggle on the bottom of them rotates port and starboard. Notice that, notice that, that's very, very important. Of course, these are stay lock fittings which can be replaced and reused, and to me, they're just a wonderful thing to have. Stay lock fittings, uh, uh, mechanical fittings, rather than swedged on fittings. Now, this is just to show you what the staysail would look like if it was up, except in this picture, which is not like my boat, my staysail only goes up here, just above the spreader, so it comes down like this. And this, this is showing you heavy weather sailing with a trysail up, we're gonna talk about a trysail later, and with a staysail here. It's not a good picture. I shouldn't have shown you this one. I just wanted to show you that the staysails should be low down, heavyweight material, and of course used in heavy weather. And if you're going to have a staysail up, you've got to have running backstays. Okay, you've got to have running backstays on a, on a standard mast like ours. So our, our running backstays are made out of T900 line, uh, which is a very low stretch line that when we made them years ago was the only low stretch line today. If I was going to replace them, I would replace them with Dyneema, a much smaller diameter and much stronger. However, it's much, 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 much more expensive. So this is just showing you how I, when I use my, my windward running back stay, when I'm using my staysail to support the mast to be in column, this is how I set it up, okay? We can go, we could have a whole seminar on just staysails. Now, when you're splicing linear core line, linear core line, you've got to be sure that you know what you're doing because this is totally different from double braid, totally different. So T900 is linear core. So this is a very, very special splice. And of course, Andy put some heat shrink tubing on it to make it look really good. So if you're going to use something like T900 or any linear core, be sure that you get someone who really knows what they're doing uh, when they splice it. By the way, if anybody wants to go to New England Ropes or to my website, my husband Andy did a really, really good, very easy to watch uh, uh, video on splicing double braid, just double braid. So uh, if you wanna learn how to do that, go to that website. Also, when we, uh, <laughs> uh, this, this has got a long, funny story, but after we'd had these beautiful, expensive uh, running lights on, uh, we put on these, these, this is to protect them from halyards and, and from Pam crashing into a dock, <laughs> which I once did. <laughs> I can tell you a story about, just, I have to tell you a story. We were coming into this harbor, we were coming into this fuel dock, and I'm, I'm the helms person. Andy will take the helm from my cold, dead hands. Andy's up on the bow. 
uh, ready to throw the aft spring, which is the only way we ever dock is with an aft spring. And he says, he turns around, he says to me very casually, be careful, Pammy, there is a strong current pushing you onto this dock. And I said, don't worry, Andy, I'm gonna kiss the dock. And with that, bam, and I took off the port running light. So this is really, this is to protect uh, our running lights from Pam's poor helmsmanship. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wasn't gonna tell you that story, but I did. Okay, now let's, let's move on a little bit. So there I am, I still haven't put on that chafe gear because I've just taken the pictures. See, it's still attached to the windlass. So please disregard that. I was just trying to take pictures uh, for this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation. First of all, I wanna show you my air conditioning system as we move aft. There is my air conditioning system. I do not have a generator aboard. I do not have air, air conditionings. However, I have 12 volt fans. I have 10 12 volt fans. Um, I'll show them to you a little later on in the presentation. They're the Cafrano fans. They draw milliamps. I can have all 10 fans running. They've got two speeds. They can articulate whichever way you want them. And when all 10 of them are going, the amp meter doesn't even read that it's uh, taking amps out of my battery. But this picture also shows uh, we have full awnings over the boat that are really easy to put up and really easy put up to take down. Because if you have awnings, especially if you cruise in the Bahamas, and by the way, you asked about the Abacos. This is the Eastern Harbor in Man of War, where our boat lived for a couple of years. Doesn't look like this anymore, but we're all going back someday. Uh, we have an awning that we can put up in three minutes and take down in three minutes. Uh, we have one that covers the bow as well. And if you have awnings to protect you from the sun, to get, protect your boat from the sun, they're up high enough so that you can walk around. They give you good visibility. You will use them all the time. And if you don't make them easy, walkable underneath, and quick to put up and quick to take down, you will have them built and you will never use them. Guaranteed, guaranteed. So I'm gonna go into this a little bit more in a minute. I wanna show you the boat hook. This is a long boat hook just made out of doweling. Um, and uh, you notice that there's a couple of pieces of tape on it. Uh, we can use this as a depth sounder if something happened to our depth sounders, especially in the Bahamas, uh, from the deck. We can put it in and we can sound up to 12 feet uh, to see uh, if, we, if we don't have a lead line handy or if we don't have a depth sounder. Uh, so I just wanted to show you that. We also have mass steps. I'll talk about those later. Uh, this is a, for those racers, of course, this is, <laughs> this is a reaching strut. My husband is always racing. I mean, we never go on a race, but he's always racing to get the best out of his boat. So this is a reaching strut for the spinnaker when we're kind of uh, beam reaching with the spinnaker up. Uh, this is just a few things to show you on the boat, but let's move on. Okay, the downwind pole. This is one of the greatest things that any boat can ever have. Um, it is for sailing with the wind on the quarter, downwind, wing and wing. And if you don't have a pole to pull out the clue of your Genoa, that poor old Genoa is going to be going bam, 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 back and forth. But if you have a downwind pole, which can be a spinnaker pole, a whisker pole, whatever you want to call it, I call it a downwind pole because we use nothing but asymmetrical spinnakers now. Um, but if it's not stowed up the mast, it's really, really difficult to deploy. I have a whole hour seminar on this, so I'm not going to go into it. But what this encompasses is a track on the front of the main, of the, of the mast, a car made by Force Bar, an FC-125 car for the inboard end of the downwind pole. It's got a topping lift that is attached to a, a cheek block at the top of the mast for the outboard end of the pole. And in two minutes, we can deploy this, this downwind pole or bring it back aboard, which makes cruising downwind, so much easier, so much better when you're going wing and wing. And I'm gonna show it to you really quickly. So here it is on the deck. You can see the topping lift on the outboard end of the pole. By the way, the outboard end of the pole should always be facing up. Always be facing up, okay? So you can always have a quick release. Uh, what you can't see in this picture, of course, are all the lines here that are uh, uh, for controlling the inboard end of the pole. But what you have is control lines on this car. You have a 
on the FC-125 car that goes up the track, you have a shackle on the top and a shackle on the bottom. You have a topping lift for it to pull it up, and you have a, a downhaul to pull it down. It's totally, totally uh, adjustable. And that would, that would be a whole other seminar. Uh, but I just wanted to show you how it is on deck when we're not using it. I also wanted to show you how we stole that, that 12 foot boat hook, just up the mast with these uh, little Velcro tabs, you know, these little Velcro straps. So easy. So when you deploy, this is a very quickie, okay? When you deploy a downwind pole, you've got the topping lift, you've got the sheet running through the end of the pole. The sheet is running through the end of the pole. The fore guy is attached and the after guy. The fore guy goes up forward through a snatch block on your bow and back down the leeward side of the boat to your cockpit. The after guy goes directly aft to your cockpit. The sheet runs through it and the topping lift, of course, supports the outward end of the pole. When the boat pole is deployed, it should look like this without the sail ever being. Unfurled. Okay, so let me just quickly show you. This is the topping. Oh, there's the topping lift. The fore guy going forward through a snatch block back to the cockpit. The after guy going directly back to the cockpit. And the Genoa sheet just going through the end of it. So when you have, let me just see, previous. When you have the pole deployed, the pole should be horizontal to the, horizontal to the water and the clue the outboard end of it should be as high as your clue so the pole has to be totally perpendicular to your mast you can't have the outboard end up too high you can't have the outboard end too low otherwise it creates pumping on your mast that would take your mast out of column it's got to be like a bow and arrow and have it exactly perpendicular to the mast and every one of these lines is pre-marked so that when it goes, when we take the outboard end up and bring the inward end down, just by letting it slide through our hand, each line has got a mark on it so we know exactly where to cleat it off, bam. And when it goes, when the outboard end goes up to the right place and the down, the pole coming down goes to the right place, bang, it goes doing like that, and the pole is in the right place. Same thing with the after guy and the fore guy. They're all pre-marked so that when I'm in back in the cockpit handling them, I just know exactly where to stop them. We can go for days on end with this pole out here because it ain't going to move. Once it's deployed, then of course, we pull out the Genoa. Now, let's say you want to reef the Genoa just a little bit because a big squall is coming up here in the northeast trade winds, okay? All you do is ease the after guy, take up on the fore guy, Ease your sheet, and as you're easing your sheet, you take a few rolls in your Genoa, okay? Let's just say a huge freighter is bearing down on you, and you gotta jive out of the way quickly. All you do is you leave the fore guy, you leave the after guy, you leave the topping lift, you ease the sheet, jive the Genoa through, because the sheet is already led through the outboard end of the pole, bam, Bob's your uncle, you're on the starboard tack. You sail wherever you want to go, upwind, downwind, it doesn't matter, get out of the way of the ship. And then when you go back on your course, all you do is you drive it back over again because the sheet is already in place. This is the easiest thing to use, the most safe thing to use, and so many people don't know how to use it properly. If you want any more information on it, call me up, I'll walk you through it. Um, Martin and John, remember that day on Genevieve when we walked through it? I hope you've used it. Anyway, I could spend two hours telling you about this. Any quick questions before we move on? And of course, if you're a, a racing sailor, you can always use this as a spinnaker pole. But we made this two feet longer than our J measurement. A spinnaker pole has to be, if you're racing, the length of your J measurement. Ours happens to be 18 feet. We made this pole 21 feet to get that Genoa out flat when we're going downwind, like a square rig ship. Okay, any questions or should I move on, Josh? Let's see here. I think we can probably take a couple of quick questions. Okay. Um, let's see here. So, uh, 
Are you using a, well, you, we're going to talk about props later, right? So let's save maybe yeah. that. Okay. So we're going to get to the prop question and we'll address the abacos. So I'd say, Pam, let's, uh, let's press on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oops, wrong way. Okay, if you sail with a spinnaker, an asymmetrical spinnaker, and I highly recommend them, because when it's really light air, this is a three quarter ounce asymmetrical spinnaker, in really light air, <clears throat> there is nothing like having a big asymmetrical spinnaker that you can close reach with or go downwind with, but not dead downwind. You need a pole or something like that. But I'll tell you what, with five knots of wind, you can almost go six knots of speed. I mean, there's nothing, no Genoa could ever do that. But a spinnaker can be difficult to handle if you don't have a spinnaker sleeve like this ATN spinnaker sleeve. And what this spinnaker sleeve does, it comes down and it, it, it collapses the spinnaker and just keeps it in this sort of like big long tube that is really easy to hoist and then really easy to bring down again. It's so safe. Now, there's one thing I got to tell you about this, though, because I've seen people do it time and again. You've got to ease the sheet of the spinnaker. You've got to ease the sheet of the spinnaker. I'm going to say it again. When you bring the ATN sleeve down, there's no way that you can collapse that spinnaker with just pulling down on the, on the sleeve. And I've seen people struggling and being lifted up in the air because these spinnakers have carry a lot of weight with the wind. So when you want to bring it down, ease the sheet, collapse it, bring it down, and Bob's your uncle. It's on the deck, ready to bring down. It's, it's just unbelievably good. And the best one, I think, is ATN, Alpha Tango November, who's right here in Fort Lauderdale. Oops. There's the sleeve. And also, if you look at the at the the tack of the spinnaker, you're gonna see what looks like a little saddle around my head stay. That is called a tacker. And it's the way that you can tack, of course, the tack of the asymmetrical spinnaker to the bow of your boat. Now, Andy always wanted to make one of those retractable poles that go out, but of course our boat, we never got around to it. But if Andy had lived, he would have put one out there. But this now has to attach to the Genoa, the rolled up Genoa, which keeps the sail from lifting up, and you can see it's tacked down uh, to a cleat on the bow of the boat. The tacker is also made by ATN, Alpha Tango November, and I encourage everybody to go to ATN Inc. and look at that website. He's got some other brilliant things uh, that you can use on your boat. So, now this spinnaker, what are we doing in this picture for those of you who know the point of sail? We're reaching with the spinnaker. We had, because of the ATN sleeve, where we knew we could bring that spinnaker down at a moment's notice, all we had to do was ease the sheet. We went for 10 straight days from Bermuda to Horta and never took the spinnaker down. Not at night at all. That's because we knew that we could bring it down quickly because of that sleeve. Okay. Just thought I would tell you that. Why do we have a yellow spinnaker? We have a yellow spinnaker because we were sailing up to Ireland and we knew there was going to be a lot of fog once we left the Azores and we got up into the higher latitudes. We wanted to be seen. If we had a white spinnaker, we'd blend in with the fog. I am not joking. As we were sailing with this spinnaker up through the pea soup fog, trying to get up to Ireland, we could honestly hear doors being slammed. We could smell people smoking cigarettes and cigars. Um, we didn't have a radar at that time, so we were just going along, hoping that if we saw, if somebody saw us through the haze and saw the, through the fog and saw that we were yellow, that they would stay out of our way. So um, I guess it worked because we never had a collision with anybody. So it worked. Uh, again, this is my air conditioning system. Uh, these, uh, uh, these wonderful hatch springs uh, are just fantastic. All we do is open the hatches and they go ka -chung. You can also see that they're on a track 
so that the hatch can be much further closed or not. Uh, to close the hatch, all you do is pull them forward, they collapse, and they go down. They're made by a company called Moonlight Marine, and we've got them on all kinds of hatches down below on the boat as well. This is the papa bear size. They come in mama bear size and baby bear size uh, for different lockers on our boat. You can also see the dogs on our, on our tea catches there as well. There's our wind scoop. Now, <clears throat> this is just looking forward on my deck. Note that we do all our halyards, topping lifts, reefing, everything like that from the foredeck itself. Nothing leads back to the cockpit, of course, except the main sheet and the sheets of the boat. There are two schools of thought of this on this, and I'm not going to say which one is right or wrong, except the one that works for you is the right one for you. Andy, being a rigger, uh, always likes to be able to go up forward, and before he pulls or eases anything, he looks up to make sure everything is okay up there. It's going to be moving all the time. Every time he goes forward, even at sea, he checks the turnbuckles. He checks, he checks the, the wire. He checks everything as he goes up forward. So we will always have everything up forward. But to do that, you have to be safe, especially in any sea, sea state. So we have what we call these mast hoops. You'll see a variety of those on different types of boats. These mast hoops are tubing. They are, they are not just, a, I mean, they're pipe rather than tubing. They're stainless steel pipe inch and a quarter pipe. You'll also notice that they have a support not only on the, on the deck, but they have one going forward, I mean inboard, so that if Andy was ever thrown against it, he'd have an extra support there that wouldn't just pull out of the deck. Underneath the supports, of course, are great big pieces of stainless steel uh, plates underneath it to support them with through hulls, I mean through bolts that are, of course, um, machine screws with great big uh, fender washers on them and things like that. So I just wanted to show you this. Andy never goes on deck without, of course, being inside of one of those. Also, ladies, note the hatch just forward of that, facing aft. That is a hatch over the head. It changed my life. I love having a hatch right over the head because when it's facing aft, what is it doing? It's exhausting. When it's facing forward, it's bringing in air. It's the most wonderful thing in the whole world. Where am I going backwards all the time? There's Andy just demonstrating how he uses how he uses the mass tubes. By the way, if you look, see the removable inner four stay out there? Just lash down. Now this is a very expensive boat. It's not a Hylus, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> and this is a mass tube that is ridiculous because look how low it is. If Andy was working on the leeward side of the boat at sea with this and a big wave hit us and rolled us, what would happen to Andy? He would just teeter-totter over backwards. You know, it's got to be at the small of your back if you're going to have a really good mast tube. Now, we also carry um, jack lines. Our jack lines go, don't, don't go up the deck, don't go along the deck. They go up high where you can use them. This picture I really shouldn't be showing you because there's my husband without his safety harness on. <laughs> Bone of contention, okay. This is, this is T900 too. This was the only kind of low stretch line back when we built our boat. Uh, I would use Dyneema today, except that I have them already. They're only put up when we leave to go to sea. They're not only handrails, but if he was wearing um, his mom, I mean his uh, life jacket, and he had his tether, he would attach it to this for a very good reason. Number one is, if for some reason he fell overboard and tethers are all six feet long, theoretically, if that tether was stretched out from that low stretch jack line, he would end up with his shoulders at the height of the deck instead of being dragged in the water. Does that make sense to everybody? Having them up high like that makes it so that when the tether is out all the way, it's six feet and it's attached to your chest up here. So your chest would be right about where the tow rail would be, okay? So that's a really important thing. If you had nylon webbing going from the stern of the boat to the bow of the boat, 
if you fell overboard and you were heavy like Andy, and that line, that webbing is nylon. What does that say to you, Josh? That says it stretches. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it's tight on deck. If a big heavy person went over the side and that webbing was, say, where the shadow is of the lifelines, goes over the lifelines, where would Andy be? He'd be at the waterline, being dragged along. And that's why tethers today have snap shackles on them rather than shackles or carabiners, carabiners, so that you can immediately release them and not get drowned by being pulled by your own boat. Well, that defeats the whole idea of a tether, doesn't it? The tether is to keep you with the boat. So if tethers are now made so you can instantly release them, where's the person gonna be? Back there. So this is one of the reasons that we have high jack lines instead of nylon jack lines from floor to aft along the deck. Also notice that we would never, ever, ever, ever put our jerry cans on the lifelines. Never, okay? Because too many times you have seen boats that get hit by a wave. It doesn't even have to be stormy weather, just hit by a wave. The jerry cans are lined up on the deck. The wave hits the jerry cans, breaks the jerry cans because there's a lot of force in that wave. And then what is there all over the deck? Diesel. So our jerry cans, because they're heavy, if we're using them, they're all inboard so that they don't make the boat heel more or, of course, be flatter on whatever side they're on, okay, you know, keeping the boat from healing more. But they're inboard where the weight should be, and if a wave came, hopefully, hopefully, they would not be smashed as quickly or as easily with as much force because they'd have to go through the lifelines first. This is just something to think about. Oh dear, why do I keep doing that? Also, this is our, this is our tender, our dinghy, our sailing dinghy. This is a little dire dow, 10-foot dire dow. I uh, just wanted to show you how we, we stow it on deck. We do not stow it on the foredeck uh, because we like to be able to work around the foredeck. Uh, and we don't like to have anything on the foredeck. So it's stowed after the mast and, of course, lashed uh, to lashings that are through bolted on the boat. So if we ever did take a, a roll or something, uh, hopefully it wouldn't come out. This is something great for people who just have uh, uh, normal reefing like we do, slab reefing. Uh, to, to take the clue out. You know, when you reef a, 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 a mainsail that is just the normal old mainsail that's on slides on the boom, slides on the track, when you reef it, you know, the steps you take are this. You ease the main sheet, take up on the topping lift, okay? Uh, take up on the topping lift, go release the halyard, put in the cringle for the, at, at the, at the hooks, for the first reef point, take up on the halyard tension, and now it's time to pull out the clue. And by this time, it's probably blowing harder than when you did the first couple of steps. So it's really hard to pull with your hands. This is for conventional reefing, to pull that clue out because it's now waving around like this. So we put a small little, tiny little Anderson winch underneath the boom, and he can sit on the deck, leave the internal reefing lines, which are actually through the, through the boom, back to this winch, click, 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 Bob's your uncle, sail is out, okay, ease off the topping lift and trim in and you're underway. Uh, to reef our sails, no matter what the conditions are, maybe takes us 90 seconds because of this little winch. Why am I doing this? Okay, just wanted to show that too. What is that track? What is that track on the mast there? Anybody know? Come on, everybody should know. We're gonna we're gonna wake up the audience here. I'm sure we can get Come a Come on, everybody. <laughs> wake up. I'll tell you, it's a trisel track. It's a dedicated trisel track. There we and go. Martin, Martin again. There he is. He's he got it first. I knew Martin would. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, what happens when the shit hits the fan and you're out in really bad weather with your mainsail? And let's just say you have a trisel. Okay, let's say you have a trisel and you're gonna put it onto the same track that your mainsail is on, even though it's got a switch track or something like that. What do you have to do to get that trisel working and the boat's not bobbing around like crazy? Well, first of all, you've gotta furl the mainsail if it's a conventional mainsail, right? 
Try furling a mainsail when it's blowing 25, 35 in a squall and it's raining and the sea is making up. Then you got to put the slides in and then you got to attach the halyard, take the halyard off the main, put it on the trisail, and then you get the trisail up. And then all of a sudden the boat starts sailing beautifully again. You're comfortable. The boat isn't healing. You've got a 10 and a half ounce trisail up and everything is cozy and nice and you're going along beautifully. Well, that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to have your own track. And when we go to sea, I don't have it in this picture, but when we go on a long passage, this trisail is very small, but very heavy material. And it's got bronze slides instead of plastic ones. We put it on, it goes down to the deck there. You can see where the little stopper is, down just above the mast boot. It only goes up about 12 inches because it's a small sail. And then we, we of course, uh, fold it up really tight and we lash the trisail to the base of the mast. Sheets are already in it, sheets are already attached to the clue, ready to go, okay? And we drop the mainsail, gasket it as quickly as possible, take the halyard off, take the bag off the trisail, put it on the trisail, up goes the trisail, and two minutes later, you're under sail again. Is everybody awake or are they sound asleep? Wake up! This is very important. <laughs> in, in the years and years of sailing that I've done, we have used the trisail three times. And I want to tell you something. Of all those three times, I am so glad we had it. So glad we had it. Our mainsail would have been shredded to pieces or it would have blown totally out of shape. It's not meant to be in, in conditions where you would use a trisail. Okay, this is something that's really cool. This we saw once in a boat up in Newport, Rhode Island. And we wanted to leave because it was so expensive just to be on a mooring in Newport, Rhode Island, right off of Bannister's Wharf. But we saw this boat with this, these kind of hatch dodgers on. We went over there, made friends with them, saw how they made them, and then came back and it took me trial and error, lots and lots of trial and error, to make these aft facing dodgers that can be left open at sea because if you notice, the aft end of them at the top sticks out 12 inches beyond the edge of the hatch. So let's just say we take some water and it hits these and the water falls down. It falls down about eight inches after the hatch, assuming you're on the wind. Assuming you're on the wind, of course. So these are unbelievably great. And I would have to tell you all, this is a whole nother seminar, but I'll show you what we do. We don't use any frames on them. We make the frames out of plywood, glass the plywood up. They're called, we call them boomerangs. And we put them in these little sleeves that we put on the edge to hold it out beyond the hatch. Then I can close the hatch if I want to. And the hatch is totally waterproof or after the squall is over or after we're in calm seas again, I can come back and open up the hatch. Notice every hatch has them. The, the little head hatch has them, the forward hatch has them, and the two aft hatches have them. And they are fantastic. Now the first time I made them, I forgot to put the windows in because the first time I made them, it was all umbrella. And when you close the hatches, it was pitch dark down below. <laughs> so during the day, so I had to take them off and put the windows in. So don't make that same mistake I did. Absolutely an incredible idea that everybody should have. Okay, there they are. Notice our jerry cans. This is in uh, the Azores. We're just getting ready to go to Portugal. Notice our jerry cans are all strapped inboard with a, with a bit of non-skid underneath them so they don't slide around. By the way, every single time we have put lots of jerry cans of diesel on the deck in case we needed it, we have never needed one drop of it. Never but it's called insurance. Oh, by the way, see this, um, see the, the roll up uh, on the side there that's lashed to the deck? That has got the sailing rig, spear guns, paddles, all kinds of stuff in it for our, our little sailing dinghy in case we ever have to get into our sailing dinghy uh, to abandon the ship. And of course, uh, when we're at sea, you don't see them, but I attach two great big fenders to them so that if we ever did have to ditch the boat and get into this sailing dinghy with the rig, we could just toss the whole rig over and it would float because it's got the fenders attached to it. So we went and picked it up 
and installed it in saline dinghy. So there's the boat ready to leave before we put the saline dinghy uh, on it, ready to go to Portugal. Mass steps, fantastic. Mass steps are great, okay? Uh, how many times have you lost a halyard, had to change a light bulb, had to change your Windex, had to lead a new VHF coax cable down the mast? Um, you'd have to go up by a bosun's chair. Do you want to do that at sea? I don't think so. Now, every time one of us goes up the mast and it's normally Andy, he always has the bosun's chair as backup, always. If he climbs up the mast, I've got a halyard on the bosun's chair and I'm taking up on, it on the winches so that he has extra margin. I love these mast steps because they've got handles that you can grab, okay? They're also aluminum. And if you're going to put mast steps on, never, never, ever let anybody tell you to use uh, rivets, even if they're stainless steel rivets. Because if you are using these mast steps at sea, and the mast, of course, the pendulum effect is getting bigger and bigger the higher up you get. There is so much shear on those mast steps from your weight. You've got to use machine screws. You've got to tap and thread every hole. And of course, you have to use gel coat when you attach them, okay, because the stainless steel fasteners into the aluminum. Always use gel coat. And here's one other trick I'm going to tell you, by the way, is 15 inches apart is the normal step a normal person can use to go up mass steps, okay? Not 20 inches because you don't want to spend so much money on mass steps and not right close to each other because you're a shrimp like me. But 15 inches, anybody can go up mass steps. Also, we like these kind better because they are enclosed stirrups. They're not just uh, platforms like the other ones that fold up, you know, because if you misstep or if your foot goes over the edge of those fold up ones, uh, you could easily slip out of them, especially when you're up high and the pendulum effect of the mast if you're at sea. So those are just a few things to remember. Also, don't forget at the top of the mast to put two of them. Okay, you don't want to be working at the top of the mast, you know, like an ostrich with its, you know. So you have to put two of them to so that when you're when you're up there on the two last steps, your torso is looking down into the mast. So you can put a new VHF coaxial cable or something up there, a new light, you know, wire or something up there. So make sure those last two steps aren't so that your hands have to be working without seeing, so that your body can be working on the top of the masthead, okay? Absolutely brilliant. We have replaced uh, light bulbs up there, actually replaced a halyard, uh, replaced the Windex many times. I just love those mast steps. Okay, solar panels. Wow. I'll tell you what, when solar panels were uh, invented, I was so excited. Look at this picture. Notice that we've got the Hank on uh, uh, Yankee up. We, this is one of our 17 pencils that we carry around the world with us. We, we bought in Australia two 55 watt solar panels and made our own solar array up there. Uh, those solar panels can, can tilt and they can rotate. So who's ever on watch, it's their job to make sure they're perpendicular to the sun. Now those are really old. I've still got them on the boat. The same two, the same ones that are charging my batteries to this day. And that was back in 1987, those were put on the boat. Um, so they're still working, and I want to tell you something. They keep more electricity in those batteries than we'll ever, ever use. They are fantastic. Notice we also carried a windsurfer around the world. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you have two children, you got to do things for those kids. Also notice the netting we have up forward. That's when they were for babies, but then we've taken that down. Also notice on the stern of the boat is a self-steering vane. When we're at sea, uh, we very rarely steer except under uh, adverse conditions. Uh, sometimes at night and things like that. We don't have an autopilot, we just have a self-steering vane. That was uh, absolutely incredible. So there are the solar panels. Uh, actually in Hope Town, you might be able to see Hope Town there. We also have a wind generator because at night the solar panels don't work. Are you all laughing? You're supposed to laugh, okay? <laughs> you, you can't hear it, but I'm sure the audience is laughing all night. Okay, everybody laugh. Are you awake? <laughs> Oh no, we're actually, I've gotten a lot of people saying they're, they're definitely tuned in and hanging on your okay. head. So you're well, doing why, great. Why, why do we have solar panels? For when we're in the high latitudes and the sun doesn't shine, right? But don't forget, uh, 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 wind generators aren't so great when you're going in the trade winds. Why? Because they're going with the apparent wind. Think about it. Wind generators, so they lose half their power because they're screaming that wind with you. <laughs> so we have 
have both of them and, and I just just love them. I don't like the the wind generator as much because it, even though it's got the six blade or one two six blades and it's supposed to be less noisy, you still you still hear or feel I should say in the boat from 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 no matter what solar panels you don't hear anything. So this is a picture of my awning. And what is the most dangerous thing that everybody who has a sailboat faces today? The most dangerous. Skin cancer, sun, UV rays, right? So that's why a simple awning like this, which is just flat, it rolls up in two seconds. All the lines that hold it in place are pre-marked. The ones that you can see going around the forward shrouds, the ones that you can see going across above the doghouse, the ones that go back to the solar array. Every single thing is, is pre-marked. It's being held up by the mainsail halyard. And it takes two minutes. You ease off the halyard, you start at the stern, you take off the lines that are pre-marked, start rolling it up, take off the midships lines, start rolling it up, take off the forward lines, wrap it up, and, and Bob's your uncle, it's done. Now, the other thing that we decided to put on, the, on this, this awning that takes two minutes to put up is a, a panel that we can see out of but keep the cockpit from having um, afternoon or early morning uh, uh, sun rays um, hurting us. So there is the curtain in the afternoon, okay, or I guess this is the early morning in uh, the Eastern Harbor at Man War Key. Very easy to put up. The textiline that we use for this, textiline is kind of like screen material so you can see out of it. Comes in every color of the rainbow, but it absolutely repels UV. And it also repels heat. So the cockpit stays really, really cool. So there it is up working. And all I did was put grommets in the edge of that awning that's so easy to put up and down with, with little S hooks. So this can be taken up, taken off. It can be put on the back of the boat, late in the afternoon in the Bahamas when you're facing the east, keep the cockpit totally cool, or it can be put up on the other side when the sun is setting. All you do is release it uh, from the S-hooks and, and just move it around. All the, all the grommets are in the same place, the same place. Okay, so there it is. Uh, let me show you a few things back here, okay? We have a mom, a man overboard module, which you can see there. Well, we have a small, tiny little outboard motor for the sailing dinghy, two and a half horsepower Honda, four stroke. We have the self-steering vane. We have our American flag. We have our stern light up high on the bow pulpit. We have the rotating uh, two 55 watt solar panels, and we've got the Rutland wind generator. All of these things on the stern of our boat. So there's the curtain in the afternoon, shading us from the afternoon sun. All I did was move it around. We also have a complete enclosed bimini top dodger uh, for high latitudes, but in low latitudes, like here in the Bahamas, we're anchored here, guys, off of the lighthouse at uh, Hopetown. We have curtains that are on great big heavy duty black plastic zippers that will not rust, okay? We use black textiline to keep out the afternoon sun, and these curtains flop down in the afternoon to keep our cockpit not only shaded, but also cool in the hot summer sun in the Bahamas. Now these can all be rolled up. See those, those plastic things that hang down from the front of the bimini top? Uh, those are just the straps to hold it up. In this picture also, you see the solar panels are canted to get the afternoon sun. And you'll see our little sailing dinghy uh, with the sail furled up there that we've all, all been uh, sailing all afternoon. There it is from, from the companionway hatch. Now here we are up in the Azores getting ready to go to Ireland. We've taken off these big heavy zippers and we've put up plastic ones, okay? Same zippers. And there I am totally enclosed in my greenhouse making our approach to Ireland. Voila. Notice my fall weather jacket is open because it's pouring rain outside in the squall, all right? I mean, it's, it's like a greenhouse, it's so, warm in there so that even when it's really cold out, if the sun is out, you could be in your jammies out here, up in Ireland in the fall. And these sporta seats are wonderful, okay? Uh, that hub on the steering wheel is for the self-steering vane, okay? 
Um, you can see these sporter seats, they're wonderful, they articulate, and I use them for a helmsman seat. Actually, when I'm steering, I use two of them so I can be up high enough to see beyond my dodger. Then uh, when it's really light wind and the wind vane doesn't work that well, the self-steering vane, this is a little tiller pilot, a uh, 12 volt tiller pilot that can attach to where the wind vane normally would be. And it just goes zit, 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 zit. And it doesn't draw anything, hardly any amps at all. And yet it works as an autopilot. And then this is unbelievable. This is a towing generator we made ourselves. It's just a regular old, uh, um, generator that you find in trucks. We bought this at a truck place and then we attached uh, 150 feet of T900 low stretch line to it, attached the end, the outboard end of the low stretch line. We uh, epoxied on a three feet of bronze uh, uh, propeller shafting and onto the back of that we put an Evan Root $20 plastic propeller. So, and also we also made this kind of, it's kind of like an articulating uh, rollick, you know, uh, so that as the generator goes up and down with the sea waves hitting the propeller and the line, it can rotate and go up and down so it doesn't chafe the line. And when we are, when we are sailing at night, we put this out every night. During the day, we never put it out because we've got the solar panels and we also fish every day. So we don't want to put this out with the fishing line as well. So this goes out at dusk, and if we're doing five knots, it's putting in eight amps. If we're doing six knots, it's putting in 10 amps. I mean, that little thing is unbelievable for charging the batteries. Now, we can turn all the lights on, we can turn on our steaming lights, uh, whatever we wanna have on at night. Um, it's, it's terrific. Now, getting it in is another thing, because as you pull the line in, it's turning like crazy. Most people would heave to, but not my husband. You know, he doesn't want to stop because he wants to make a fast passage. So Andy would be back there pulling this thing in as it was trying to pull itself out of itself. And I have never heard so much Australian swearing in my life as when he would bring this in every morning. Uh, here we, uh, these are some good ideas too. Don't, a ram mic for the cockpit, okay? Uh, this is a, a, an outdoor mic that you can put on in your cockpit that attaches to your VHF radio. Oh, I still have time, don't I? Oh no, it's past time. I can stop now because the rest are just good ideas down below. Do you want me to keep going, Josh, or do you want me to stop and we can do down below another time? Well, you know, um, I think we should probably make the interior a whole nother section because be honest, I, and I think, and, and I'd like to open it up to the audience here because I mean, I know we're, you know, two hours in. Would it be a good idea to open this up for uh, sort of a segment two? I mean, Pam, I think you're definitely up for it. And oh, I think yeah. that might let us definitely get more involved with doing the interior. So Sure, sure. I was okay. just about to start yeah. the interior, so this yeah. is a perfect place to end. Why, why, why don't we do that? Why don't we do, let's schedule a segment two. Okay. And we'll do the interior and everybody Perfect. that's online, everybody that's online, I will make sure you are emailed uh, a, a link to register for Pam Wall 2.0. <laughs> well, you know, this is wonderful because normally I have to, I have to compress this seminar yeah. into an hour and 15 minutes. And you know what? I can't get all the information to people that I want to. That's right. Oh, can That's we right. have a quick Q&A now if anybody wants to do it live and share their questions if they want to? Yeah. Or if they I'll want to go what? and have cocktails, it's fine with me. Well, I'll tell you what. I think because I know we're right up against when we have our virtual oh, yes. happy hour. So That's what right. I would say is if you guys would like, join us live for our virtual happy hour, which if you go to davidwaltersyachts.com slash sailing events, and I'm going to type in the address here. I'll come too, so they want to ask That's questions. Right. Why don't you guys join us on our virtual happy hour? Go to davidwaltersyachts.com. Go to our events page. If you're not already registered there, you can join us there. Uh, Pam's going to be there, and we'll be able to do a little bit more uh, Q&A. So, yeah. Can I just say one quick thing? Oh, of course. 
the thing that I want to leave everybody with, and I always want to do this for every, every seminar, every presentation, every time I see people, is go while you can. Yeah. Get your boat. Get out there. I know we have, we have a structure now that we can't do that. But as soon as this is lifted and we can get out to sea, the best life you can have is on a sailing vessel that will take you wherever you want to go. And I want to tell you something. It gives you a freedom that you have never experienced in your life. And it also gives you a ton of responsibility. But the coolest thing of all is that you are responsible for yourself, for your boat, for your family. And, and for all the people that you meet as you sail away, I don't think that there's a better lifestyle for anybody. And I speak as a mother who brought her two children up on a boat. So please, if you get anything from this seminar at all, make it to follow your dreams as soon as you can. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Right. Of course, thank you everybody. And like I said, join us for our virtual happy hour. We're gonna move right into that after this. And I will make sure that everybody who attended today gets a link to join us for, uh, yeah, segment two, okay? And also, could they either write to you or to me any questions that they have? Yes. My, you know. Yeah, Pam, I will send you the full list of questions that we were not able to get to today, okay? Okay, okay. And they can always reach me at pam at pamwall.com. That's right. In okay. fact, I'm going to put Pam, uh, Pam's email address here in the comments section and i'm going to make sure everybody who attended has your contact information as well so good because awesome. i live for helping others achieve i know you do what i, I was able to and you're 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 one of a kind pam so <laughs> all right well hey grab yourself a drink and i'm going to see you over at our virtual happy hour here in about 30 seconds thank you thank you everybody all right guys